Welcome to the Feds, insiders bringing accountability, integrity, and reform to a broken bureaucracy. At Feds for Freedom, we value constructive dissent and healthy debate. The views and opinions shared in today's episode are those of the speaker alone and do not express the views or opinions of the U.S. government or any other employer. Welcome to the Feds, where all are emboldened to stand up for their liberty and freedom. We are your co-hosts, Stephanie Weidel and Demis, and today we are honored to interview Jeremiah Hansen, an aerospace engineer who has worked for the U.S. Navy for the past 15 years. He took a bold stand at the Naval Surface Warfare Center Dahlgren Division, which we will be hearing about today. He is a family man with eight children who takes great interest in cultivating the maturity and integrity of young men through his involvement with trail life. Today, we will discuss what Jeremiah witnessed in our government over the past couple of years, how it impacts the freedoms of all Americans, and what you can do about it. Welcome, Jeremiah. Thanks so much for coming on to the Feds. Thanks for having me, Stephanie and Dennis. I really appreciate it. Could you give us a little bit of your background, your education, and your family background? Um, I've uh, got an aerospace engineering degree, so I'm the proverbial rocket scientist in the room. Um, I have eight kids, a wife who I love dearly and definitely has helped me uh, hold the line. Uh, Without her support, it'd be a lot harder. Um, And we've been married for 22 years, so uh, been been, uh, the family man for quite some time. I've worked both as contractor and as federal government, so I've I've been seen both sides of the fence. Although I've been federal government lately, um, and uh, been very interested in in trying to make sure that uh, I live with integrity. I live with uh, uh, I live as a gentleman, and in, in, in I guess the more historic sense. In the past correspondence that we've had, you mentioned that you were really interested in history and reading the founding documents. Could you talk a a little bit about how you got into really studying the Constitution and all the papers that went along at that time. Um, one of the things that, uh, yeah, I'm very interested in history. I've read a lot of history, probably way more than most people actually do in their lifetimes. Um, and uh, it's just a subject that interests me. Um, kind of want to know what people have done in the past and how they look at things. And um, so, it was probably a good decade or two ago when you started seeing people talk about how the federal government wasn't doing what it was supposed to. I'm like, okay, well, what is it supposed to actually do? And so I started reading the the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, because people are like, well, this is an important document. Well, I don't know if I've ever actually read it. Uh, so I sat down and I read it. Um, it's a little long, but not much longer than some things. Um, and I started going, well, wait a second, what does this phrase mean? What do they mean by this? And so you had you know, to find out their words, they were, wrote a lot of things. So I'd read some of the Federalist Papers and the Anti-Federalist Papers. Um, read some John Locke. He is not the most transparent person to read, um, but he does make some excellent points. And I started trying to understand, you know, what is, what are people saying? What is it actually supposed to do? Um, and I would read some of the, you know, I'll say more contemporary modern things, including, you know, stuff from the, the socialist side, you know, I guess to put the other pin on the other side, just to understand what they're, what are you after? What are you trying to do? And I started discovering that the, none of the stuff is new. Uh, the stuff that we see today uh, in various forms and in, in the media, there's almost verbatim throughout history. So a lot of it's nothing new. So reading through it gave me some insight as to, all right, what, what is actually happening today? How are things going? Um, and then it started, you read the Federalist Papers and you start reading like, okay, when they talk about freedom of speech, they're not talking about, you know, um, oh, so I can just say what I want about this thing, but nothing else. Or I want to, you know, it made it so that it was clearer what they intended, because you can argue all day about whether or not this comma means that or that word means this. But unless you understand what the, they actually intended, you're just more or less talking about your opinion about things. And I'd much rather understand what those men came up with because he argued with it for a time. Uh, we had the Declaration of Independence. We got our independence. We were the Confederate States for a while. That didn't work. It failed miserably. And um, they held a constitutional convention to find out how do we fix this? And after a month or two, they realized that it wasn't doable. They couldn't make the Confederacy better. And so they threw it out. They rebuilt, they rewrote the Constitution for a uh, 
a federal government. The part that makes it interesting and, and pertinent is that it's a constitutionally limited representative government. It's a republic, not a democracy in the strictest sense, and it's constitutionally limited. So whatever's in the Constitution is only what they're allowed. The Constitution actually says that. Mm -hmm. So when you start looking at what they want to do, like, oh, well, we need to do lockdowns. Well, there's no provision in the Constitution for that. Well, well, I'm going to use an emergency power. There's no provision for that. You can't suspend rights because you want to. There's only one right that's uh, allowed in the uh, Constitution. That's under martial law, and it's habeas corpus, which means to show the man. So you can't require that the government to present somebody in a martial law environment. That's the only one. Uh, right to assemble, right to speech, uh, right to do whatever you want, right to have religion, right to not have religion. All those are not suspendable by the government, whether by law or by executive order or by decree. How did you join federal service? Why did you want to work for the Navy? Um, and what were you doing before? Uh, the, the big irony of working for the Navy is when I was taking, uh, getting my degree, I had an option to do also uh, as a dual major, uh, ocean engineering, which is naval architecture. And uh, I was like, eh, I don't really want to spend an extra year. What am I going to work for the Navy? Um, I think God has a sense of humor. So I've been working for the Navy most of the time since I graduated uh, in one way, or shape or another. So um, after I graduated work, mm, about, six or seven years for the Navy as a contractor in various roles. Um, worked a few years up north, and then the drive just sucked. Um, three or four hours on <laughs> the way home, that's really not a long-term solution, uh, especially with little kids. I realized that was not going to work. And so my wife suggested, well, Dahlgren's having a, a job fair. How would you go out there? I'm like, okay, well, I'll give it a shot because it's close. Um, and I managed to – they. They hired me from that for doing some uh, uh, aerospace modeling. And so mm -hmm. I've been there ever since. Um, going back to uh, God's sense of humor, I was like, okay, I'll work for the federal government two or three years, and then I'll, I'll work back as a contractor trying to do some more space stuff. Well, every time I try, God's like, nope, nope, I need you here. Okay. Um, so when all this happened, I'm like, maybe this is why I'm supposed to be here. Um and uh, given, this, given the success we were able to have, I uh, really can't argue that that is not the case. So what did you start seeing in March of 2020? I actually was watching the news in December of 2019, and you started seeing the discussions about, uh, you know, there's this new virus in, in, in China. And I was like, okay, well, right, viruses happen all the time, especially in China. They're always talking about this virus, that virus. Um, and then I was watching and they're like, oh yeah, people are dying in the streets. And of course they have the one shot of one guy falling down the street. And they play that like 12 different times as if it's different people. I'm like, okay, well, it's the same guy, but the Chinese are running <laughs> around in bio suits. That's not normal. Yeah, every, every time before you'd see him run around with like a face mask and, and hustle people off or whatever, but they're, they're running around in bio suits. I'm like, that's not normal. Um, so I started paying a lot more attention to it. Um, so when they're like, oh, well, it's, it's in the United States in March. I'm like, I'm pretty sure it came sooner. Um, so when they're trying to like cut off the, the flights, I'm like, that's probably a good idea if they're running around in bio suits. No, 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 you can't do that. Oh no, it's here. Well, what did you expect? Um, and so I started watching and, and paying attention. And as I was watching the response of leader, leadership uh, governments across the globe, I was watching and noticing a lot of fear and acting in fear or acting in a way that utilized fear to cement control, especially in uh, countries that were, I guess, closer to China. So you'd see a lot more people like, you know, freaking out. Government's like, oh, no, we'll save you. Just make sure you stay home. And I'm like, OK. And I knew at that point that it was likely going to come here. Um, and then that fear was going to be pervasive. And the other part that tripped me off that something weird was a mock is that everyone was doing it in unison. Even countries that didn't have it were acting as if they had a massive uh, uh, rate of it. Like, oh, we're at 50%. Other countries, oh, we don't have any recorded, but we're going to do lockdowns anyway. Well, that's weird. As time progressed, they were talking about, you know, well, it came from this, this meat market. Okay. Well, where does this strain come from? 
Oh, well, it comes from bats several hundred miles away. I don't think you're capturing bats a couple hundred miles away and taking them to a meat market. That's not really how markets work all that well. You don't have a fresh meat market several hundred miles away. Um, and so there's, there's, you know, some stuff wasn't paying it, wasn't making sense. Um, and then it came out that there is a level four bioweapons or bio, bio research lab, which they're essentially the same thing. Um, because they take the same precautions, look at the same stuff. Um, gain of re function research is, if you look at the history, is a variation of bioweapons, but it's the quote unquote good side of it versus the bad side. Instead of trying to kill people, we're trying to keep people from dying. When did you start seeing the fear take hold in your own workplace? Um, let's see, I'm trying to think. It was probably around April when they started doing like the stay home for so many weeks. Um, they implemented like um, contact tracing, which after a couple of weeks of paying attention to contact tracing in general, it was clear that it was being spread in ways that contact tracing wasn't tracing. Um, and so, you know, people who had no contact with other people are coming down with it. And I'm like, okay, this is not a normal thing, guys. Mm -hmm. so contact tracing is not doing it, but they were doing it anyway because it was the best they had. They were essentially groping at straws. How's your colleagues and your, your manager was handling this whole thing? <laughs> the, um, the management more or less was following along what they were told because they didn't really have an idea what to do. Communication was often spotty, uh, partially because some of them were had COVID, some of them were on telework, some of them were, you know, various things all around. And in general, it was various levels of fear for the most part. The people who were most fearful, you could tell. They were just plain afraid. So masking was implemented at some point that summer, correct? Yeah, you had to mask uh, unless you were in a closed room by yourself. Um, let's see, there's one other feature uh, in the in the masking. I think even the, wrote, the, I think uh, if you were outside by yourself, you could do it. Yeah. You could go without a mask. And eating, yeah, you had to lower your mask. And yeah, you, you, get, you could lower your mask, mask to eat, but you had to put it back up when you were done. Which doesn't make any sense. Oh my because... god, I, I laughed on these policies so many times because I never followed them anyways because it was just so ridiculous. Yeah. So when did you come to realize that the government was going to um, ask you to go against your beliefs? Now, you knew, we all knew something was brewing in the summer of 2021, mm -hmm. but there was, was there a time before that that you <laughs> felt like they were going to actually mandate the shots when they came up with the vaccine in nine months i'm like well one that's way too fast two that only has really one purpose and three they're acting on a fear so they're going to act in, in a fearful way um i kind of assumed that was going to be the case so i started researching what they were how they're made and things like that and that's where i came across that uh, for the pfizer and the moderna they use an mrna uh, methodology um, the Johnson Johnson using MRA, mRNA, but a slightly different methodology. Here's a here's my question to you. So, obviously, the entire world freaked out. Um, mm -hmm. A small percentage of individuals and people not as freaked out as you know majority of the world. And you know, we witness in the office environment how you know people can turn against one another because of difference of opinion. Um, now, once the the shots were developed, once the shots were actually this, uh, um, being given out, and you know people taking and all that stuff, what was the atmosphere in your in your office space? What happened? Did you did you come across individuals actually you know once once being good friends, then no longer friends because they have a different opinion on the shot, or did you see anything like that in your office space? Yeah, there is. Um... There are stories and reports and, and things I heard from other folks uh, keeping this generic on purpose. Um, there were people who would stop talking to people. People would literally avoid people. Um, there were people as soon as the shots came out and they were, you know, okay, like, hey, I'm going to get a shot. And if they found out you weren't, they would be like, okay, well, why aren't you getting the shot? What do you mean you're not getting the shot? Uh, some people went so far as to say, why are you trying to kill people? Um, there were stories about people being berated for not getting the shot, mm -hmm. especially after the mandate. What's wrong with you? Um, people who are blackballed, 
Um, there were people who their spouses uh, wanted to get the shot and they didn't want to get the shot. Um, I believe several marriages actually failed because of it. Um, the power of fear, people were, were, were afraid and they were running. And so the people who were most afraid ran to the shots first. Uh, and then anyone who didn't take the shots very quickly become and became like their enemy. And it was, it was quite sad um, watching people run in such fear. And um, I was spending a lot of time paying attention and, and researching so that I knew what it was I was facing. And I was not seeing the same signal. I mean, if you watch the news, it was like, oh, fear, doom and gloom. But then we actually did the reading and he paid attention to what was coming out. He, the same story wasn't there. And so I started getting doubting some of the stuff, but I was being very cognizant of how people were reacting. And, and a lot of cases, um, the, those folks who are doubtful on the vaccines went quiet. They went dark. Uh, they wouldn't yeah. talk about it. Wouldn't make mention of it. Um, there were times where people would say, Oh yeah, I'm getting the vaccine. And they would be talking about it. I just wouldn't say anything simply because I didn't want to get in that essentially <laughs> combative nature. Um, I didn't, I didn't want to, you know, have a different opinion. And I guess you can say I self-censored because it was easier to do that. Yeah. than to run the risk of ire of their ire and, and discord within the, you know, it, it got in the way of the mission of, the, of what you're trying to do. Uh, there was it kind of reached a stasis point where the people who gotten the vaccine kind of realized the people who didn't get the vaccine didn't want to argue about it or talk about it because yeah. we had made up our minds and we just didn't want to deal with it. Um, and we're trying to get work done um, sometimes in difficult structures um, with working arrangements and people in, people out, people not wanting to come in because there's COVID around, um, you know, the, the, the fear based decision making that they were making. Um, once it was announced, the, I'll say it went sour fast, uh, just in general. So you had the people of vaccine, like, see, see, you're, you're in danger of losing your job because you're not doing the right thing. Yeah. It became, it became a, uh, uh, a mark of whether or not you're moral or not almost, uh, which is completely wrong. Um, and it became something that really kind of soured. Um, and that was, and that was where, you know, those of us were like, no, we're not going to take a shot. It violates our beliefs. Uh, we're looking at going, okay, well, what do we do? Um, how do we, how do we structure this? Um, that's kind of how we hold rights even got started. Uh, someone's trying to figure out, all right, how do we do this? And they had a meeting on their deck. There were seven of us at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and we decided that, you know what, no matter what, we're not going to get the shot. We're going to fight. Um, I guess we're just a little bit more plucky out here rural <laughs> and all. um but uh one of the uh, uh the first things um that i had to do though is decide all right what was it going to do um i could you know even when they're before it became enacted it was clear that they were going to mandate and the executive orders came out um i had to decide okay am i going to hold by my beliefs or i'm going to buckle um I had to, that's the first decision you have to make. Uh, some people decided they're going to do it and they provided their own justification and I'm not going to get on anybody one way or the other. But the problem being is that once you buckle your, your beliefs it become malleable. Um, and it was one of those things where if I had told my kids that I needed to be, do the right thing, no matter the cost, I had to do it. It was not a question. Because if I'm going to tell my children that I'm going to do the right thing at all costs and say, well, eh, except for this thing, what did I just tell them? Everything I just told them before about it being all cost was a lie mm -hmm. or it's malleable for anything that you'd want to justify. Yeah. I've undercut it. I, I saw that in myself and my relationship with my children um, over the masking that mm -hmm. I knew as a musician. <laughs> that masking was not right. I, mm -hmm. I was shocked that the fine arts, the, the opera singers that I knew so well, that they would not stand up and say anything about how bad the masking was for you. Singing on stage with a mask on, really? I was so upset. So I talked with my children about this and then 
so when we had doctor's appointments and these doctors were not one of us and I had, I couldn't give in and I had to stand my ground. I don't regret it at all. I am so thankful. I kept going and yes, I made a scene everywhere I go or I went, but I'm so thankful to have had that inner sense of, I got to stand with my children right there next to me and stand for what I know to be right. And I talked with them about the science of masking. They watched the same Stephen Petty videos on YouTube that I did. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. No, that's fine. Um, it, and everyone had to make their own decisions on what they were willing to fight, what they weren't, um, and how you were willing to fight. So one of the things that we did with the masks is so my wife would make me a cloth mask for work. It just was a little bit thinner than most. Um, and uh, we had a large family trip. Um, and so we had to deal with TSA. Well, they were also selling mm -hmm. those masks that looked like masks, but were otherwise porous. And we put those on. And surprisingly, no COVID. Strange. Um, so we... we we chose how we were going to fight it. The vaccines were certainly a no-go. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I was willing to use the masks in such a way that I gave enough semblance of compliance to essentially hide, but not enough to be a problem. Um, and when it came to having it on or versus having it off, well, the office space was kind of more lenient than the official word. The official word is if you have, if you're in an office with people, you have to have it on, depending on how plucky you were feeling that during the day most people just had it off when they were in their little cube section because well no one cares when you're facing your computer um and i guess there was a little bit of a tacit thing that as funny. long as the computer but, had antivirus then i guess <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I mean, <laughs> well, sterilizing it's all good. Um, the uh, the irony is during this this period but just before the the uh vaccines, one of the people in the office who always wore a mask came down with COVID. And the day she came down with COVID, I really didn't have my mask on at all that day. I'm like, okay, well, this is going to test the science because we're, I'm supposed to be sicker than a dog and she's supposed to be fine. Um, mm -hmm. Turns out it didn't work that way. And uh, they recovered and I sat there and I'm like, okay, well, I didn't get COVID. Clearly they got COVID. Apparently, this is not quite the uh, cut and dry uh, case they're making. And did you point this out to anyone in your office? Uh, it was kind of obvious because I was not exactly the most studious masker. Does that make sense? Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I pushed, no, uh, and I was there any interest in? Hmm. Was there any interest in? recognizing that what they had been told was not happening in real life? Were they interested? No, it was very strange. It's kind of like a double think. Yeah. Um, they're like, well, this, this didn't work. Maybe I just didn't do it well enough. Um, I would see that in articles too. They were talking about, you know, I was taking care of this person with COVID. I was very careful with the mask and washed my hands and I got down with COVID, came down with COVID. And then I, but I just made sure I got a better mask. That's, that's not how it is. Um, in the summer of 21, I think is also when the CDC very, very, very quietly make mention of how it was actually airborne. Um, for those who are aware of what airborne means, so the flu is by droplet, so it has to be inside a large droplet of water uh, or larger than the virus by a certain amount so for it to survive. Airborne means it's the either the virus or a very thin sheath of stuff around the virus to keep it alive. Um, the virus can, can be out on its own. Well, that drastically changes the size. So the virus, and I know this because I was just looking it up, is like 120 or 0.125 microns or something like that. Very, very small. Um, and uh, they were testing it and they found it as low as 0.25, which is the diameter of the virus plus two times two, which means a virus with a very small sheath around it. Um, and there was the code for the virus inside the droplet. So they knew that it was in there. Uh, in this study, um, the N95 masks are 95% in the 0.3 micron, give or take about 0.2. Well, that's right in your virus area, which is why the masks didn't actually work, um, at least as they were told. 
Um, so the, vi the virus can go right through the surgical, the N95 and everything else. Mm -hmm. And 5% of a, of a virus is less than 100%. It just means it takes more time to get full exposure to have an infectious amount. Was it N95 at 3 micron as well? Uh, I think it's it's in that in that range. I might be slightly off. So I have your special uh, paper right here that you just put out, which I want to get to okay. um, very soon. But N95 masks filter only 95% of 0.1 to 0.3 micron particles, letting infectious particles pass through. Yep. Hmm. Yeah, that's why I was studying it. And I was putting that out. Um, so the N95 masks, even though they were acquired, weren't actually doing anything, which is why if you pay attention right after the military, they're requiring masks and doing um, uh, special holds on ships and things. There was a couple of ships that went out to sea and after about three weeks came down with COVID throughout mm -hmm. the entire ship, which if the masks were working and the filters were working and the sanitizer was working, should never have happened. So those were indicators to me that something was definitely wrong with the methodology being used. Mm -hmm. uh, the only way to filter stuff that small is to use a really a, a bio safe filter you know the type you see on gas masks or the the full bio suits we've talked a lot about the background of covid what happened immediately what you saw what brought you to the realization you did not want to take this shot mm -hmm. um let's talk about how you pushed back and immediately in the um in the mandate that was published it said that exemptions prop it's something like proper exemptions would be accepted or religious or i forget exemptions would be accepted so did you put in an exemption they were due by november was it 21st of 2021 something like that it was it was pretty quick thereafter um one of the things that uh the discussions that we had so the executive order said uh, you were exempt if you had an accepted uh, medical or religious exemption. Mm -hmm. uh, that terminology is actually important because the go federal government, according to federal law, cannot decide whether or not you believe anything. You have to put it in. And there are, unless they can prove that you don't believe it, they can't say no. Um, and that's in the federal law. It's in, I think it's actually in one of the sections that's in that flyer. Um uh, so you had asked about how do we push back? We decided first, mm -hmm. like, okay, well, there's seven of us. How do we get more of us? Because we know there's more of us, but how do we get some some knowledge of that? Um, and we started, you know, publicize, publicizing carefully that we were there. And uh, the group would double every about a week or two. Uh, so, so how did you publicize? Word of mouth. Mm -hmm. uh, so at the time, we didn't have anything other than word of mouth. And we started holding... Um, meetings or for lack of a better phrase, get togethers so we could share information. Okay. What is this information? How do we do this? How, do, what does this mean? Um, and what was the group's reaction to the Galenus, um, the Galenus letter that came out? I forget. Was that October? Yeah. Yeah. About could you October. talk a little bit about that? Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the reaction was between. So talk, talk a little bit. Talk a little bit about what Galena said. Okay. You started uh, with Frankly and who yeah. Galena is. He's a vice admiral. He's a vice admiral. He just retired recently. Uh, he should have been um, fired immediately for the email. Yes. Just because it was so tone deaf. Yes. Um, he pretty much, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase here because I don't have the verbiage in front of me. You can probably add it to the podcast directly below. Um, but he said, you know, frankly, there's no reason for anybody to un be unvaccinated if you're unvaccinated, you clearly do not belong in the Navy. I want to make sure you all leave, essentially, is the tone. Um, and this is in an email out to NAVC, which is like 25, 30,000 people. It's not like a small group that he put it out to. It was a very large group. Um, every one of us uh, was between appalled and incensed. Mm -hmm. um, one for the tone deafness. I mean, even if you don't agree with somebody's opinion, and even if it's even if it was against a actual legal order, um, you know, like don't shoot your neighbor, um, that would still be a bad email. If this was any other situation, um, that would be grounds to have the admiral uh, removed. 
uh, the commission would have been fought, removed because of the tone, because of the way. And he, d he did like three paragraphs of why you're a really bad person um, while saying, I appreciate your opinion, but you're a terrible person. Um, it was really, it was really underhanded. Um, if I'm sure there are copies available uh, online, I, if anyone's not really believing what I'm saying, you need to read it. Uh, I will like, include a copy. My uh, husband has kept his records. Yes, likewise. Um, and I think it was actually uh, there was, I'll say, very veiled reference to possibly a discussion that he might have been had better tact in that email afterwards because even uh, representatives who saw it tried to call the DOD on account like, what is this? Mm -hmm. um, but Congress didn't really get much much traction on it. Um, but it just made our resolve to fight all that stronger. Mm -hmm. um, going back to the group, so as we were forming, we were like, okay, what do we do with this, these religious exemptions? We tried finding lawyers, we couldn't find any. Uh, Feds for Medical Freedom, well, thankfully they found the lawyers and they were able to get the injunction. Uh, we tried, we, we drew up, drew a blank. Uh, there was a lot of lawyers who didn't want to, didn't want to even touch fighting the federal government. Uh, some of them were of the mistaken opinion that, yes, this is completely legal, this is completely okay, and that's not. Um, and so we were drawing a blank on that. The best we could come up with is put in the exemptions so you at least have legal grounds to fight it later. And so I put in an exemption. I knew they weren't going to read it or care because they're already rejecting exemptions from the military um, with formulators, which is also uh, illegal to do. Um, regardless of who it is, you can't do that because they're supposed to address the particular concerns of the exemption. Uh, if you say I don't do it because, you know, it's made with protein and then you go out you, they have pictures of you at a Burger King, well, that might be a problem for you. Um, but if you're doing it because I have religious uh, um, opposition to either vaccinations, because that, that does exist, or to um, how it was made, they can't say, well, your concerns are unwarranted, go get the shot. Uh, but that was the terminology coming out of the official stuff. It's like, well, we know we're pretty sure that everyone's just making this up so they didn't have to get the shot. So just expect to get the shot. Um, my response was over my dead body. Good luck. Um, because I was I was willing to put everything on the line. Um, and uh, one of the things that happened went right after the mandate went into effect, you know, into effect, big air quotes, because it really was not legitimate art in the first place uh when i came home when my kids go they fire you yet dad <laughs> not exactly but I don't know what to do and i said nope not yet we'll see if they actually get around to it um <laughs> and so it was one of those uh, we decided that we put in exemptions um i was very thorough in mine and, and making sure it was very it was referenced to scripture um scripture says you shouldn't benefit from the death of another person uh you shouldn't uh take advantage of the living uh, and things like that. Um, and and so when you're using the cells, it's repugnant to me. I can't do it, um, it doesn't matter. And so the um, uh, when they were requiring it, we put in exemptions. Some people put in religious, some people put in medical, some people put in both. Um, and they all, and they said, all right, well, where's it going? Uh, well, we just have to send it up. Um, but all of the department heads had Excel files with all of your personal information and whether or not you filed an exemption. Uh, and there are computers. Well, that violates PII rules. You can't have that without it being encrypted and all the other fun things. They just had regular access to it. So we, they knew who, who didn't have it. Um, and that's probably why in various commands you had people who were harassed and um, outside of dog and a herd of people who were regularly forced to test because they didn't have the vaccine, uh, regardless of whether or not the vaccinated were getting sick. So at this time, so we're talking like um, fall and winter into the winter of 2022. So fall of 2021, you were gathering with your group of people and you started, did you start at that point, the website we hold rights? Uh, Tell us a little bit about that. That that time frame was so crazy, weird, and fast. Um, so I started leading the group because uh, it was 
kind of fell into my lap, so to speak. Um, I didn't go out and be like, hey, let's go fight this, and I'm going to lead the charge. It was, okay, well, we need someone to start organizing, and I just picked it up. Um, and so we had it, people who were like, well, what can I do? Like, well, what, what ideas do you have? Because right now, I can't think of all the ways we can go fight this. Uh, one of the members started protests, um, so we would sit on the main road to the main gate. There's two gates in Dahlgren, but the, the main gate uh, is called Gate A. Um, standard military parlance, we use the most obscure methods to call things. Um, and so we would protest on the way in. Um, we started the website uh, because one of our goals was to share information as quickly and as fast as possible because we couldn't keep up with it. You know, mm -hmm. Information was coming in. This is what the COVID does. This is what the vaccine does. This is what the, the, the administration is doing. This is what these bases are doing. This is, you know, it's just going really, really fast. And so we started the website um, and and I was just like, all right, you, you've got this idea. You run with it. What help do you need? Just reach out and, and work from there. Um, What's the website called? Uh, WeholdRights.com. And it's got a whole bunch of very useful information on uh, the vaccines, uh, how to file EEO complaints, how to do FOIA, mm -hmm. um, uh, some pictures from our protests um, with the faces blurred out accordingly. Um, and just it became a very useful form of sharing information as quickly as possible. Uh, one of the early discussions was, all right, well, what do we call ourselves? And we had this long discussion, um, everything under the sun, and then we kind of boiled out to, well, we hold rights. We're not giving them up. We're not going to to just say, okay, well, you said I should give it up. Here we go. Uh, it was it was part of this. You know, we're still holding them. Well, you do not take them, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of an in your face type of way of doing it. But it's also true. We hold rights. We don't we don't hand them out as candy for people to use against us. Um. And the, uh, I guess the direction I was giving people was let's keep it as honest and true as possible. Because we could have went with clickbait type approach and, you know, half baked things and stuff like that. We wanted to make sure that we are as, as solid as possible, so people had the best information possible. And um, you did that. Yes, and I, that was as it was going on, and as the website was developing, I was telling them like, this is awesome. This is great stuff. Mm -hmm. You guys have done a, a tremendous job putting it together. Um, and we weren't going to shy away from, oh, well, well, maybe they might be upset. Most of us were more or less along the lines of, if they get upset, great. Welcome to the party. Um, so we, <laughs> we, we didn't shy away. Um, at one point, I think it was about mid-20, uh, early spring 2022, we took some of our flyers we had been putting around uh, various places, uh, Dahlgren included. And, uh, well, we mailed them to everyone up the chain of command, including Galinas. Um, <laughs> so uh, we sent out about three or four flyers at, uh, at different times for every couple of weeks or so. Uh, I'm sure that those probably uh, generated a little bit of ire. Um, but <laughs> our, our approach was, welcome to the party. You want to be upset? You want to you want to just shoo us in the corner? Well, we're just going to make sure we don't go away and we're not quiet. Because it's really hard to fire somebody who's telling you you're wrong and I'm not going to go away. Um, mm -hmm. Mostly because then you just look like you're firing somebody you didn't agree with, which is mm -hmm. kind of true. Um, Did you, so uh, um, maybe this is a good time to bring up the pamphlet you all just put out about mm -hmm. Do I Have to Mask? And um, did you, this looks like something that you would have put out back then as well. It, or was it's, this it's, recent? It's recent. Um, I, I wanted so uh, probably about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, we started hearing about this "quote unquote" new new variant of of COVID, which seemed to have the same number of changes on the spike protein as previous versions of COVID, et cetera, et cetera. And they were starting to ramp up the uh, the oh, you should mask. Oh, we got a new vaccine coming out; it's going to be more pertinent. Um, and kind of starting that drumbeat again. Um, since I had seen it before and I knew it was coming, I was just kind of waiting for it to show up. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they were talking about is, oh, we need to mask again. Uh, several schools systems were like, oh, no, no, we need to mask. 
Um, and the only reason why I ever saw him come off of that recently was that people are like, uh, no. Um, so I wanted to give people an opportunity to say no. A lot of people were masking because they didn't know what it meant. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't even know you couldn't legally require somebody to mask. Um, they're, yes. They're under and that was, that was your first uh, bullet point right here. Um, mm -hmm. Masks are emergency use. Now, the code that you gave, the U.S. Code 21, mm -hmm. 21 U.S. Code, is that the Nuremberg Code? Um, there's actually not an official Nuremberg code, it's say, the, but it's the right. code that says you have to have consent for any experimental uh, case. Right. Um, I guess you could call it the Nuremberg code. It's like the Nuremberg code put into federal law. Yeah. And so deep down in the federal code, which is, you know, the, well, the most boring stuff you can read, um, there is a set that says you have to have consent to use, to be forced to use it any emergency use authorized material, uh, which meant the vaccines also were EUA. Um, community or, or whatever they called the official one, it wasn't actually available when they had it. And they were saying, oh, well, all of them are equal. No, they're not. They're different in law. Um, regardless of even if they're the same beyond the label, they're still different in the law. Mm -hmm. uh, and so masks are that way. And the, the flyer was try to give more people opportunity to realize that they have choices they can make. It's not a requirement that they have to follow the line because somebody with uh, a special title or a special position says they have to. Um, and also calls into mind, you know, the mass that they were talking about, like, oh, it's to, to slow the spread. Well, it actually doesn't do that. Uh, it hasn't been shown to be effective. Um, the Cambridge report that came out, they did a survey of studies. Um, and after the survey, they said, we can't find evidence that they were effective, uh, masks and lockdowns and all the stuff that were in there. Um, you did see some spin doctoring going on where they're like, oh, no, no, that means that they didn't find it was bad, but that's not how science works. You have to prove it works, not prove it doesn't work. You can't prove something doesn't work because there's always a condition where you might've overlooked. So if you can't find that it does work after two years and... 68 studies, I think, and, and several hundred thousand million people that have gone through it, it doesn't work. And mm -hmm. so I'm trying to give people an opportunity to say, hey, you know what? I have a choice in this. I don't want to deal with the nasty st side effects of it, which is, you know, volatile co compounds. Uh, some of them are carcinogens. Um, some of them are microplastics. That stuff's getting into your lungs. And if you're afraid of COVID, COVID doesn't do the nasty stuff. Those things will. So. And and this report that you're referencing is the Cochrane report, correct? Oh, Cochrane, yeah. Sorry. Cochrane. Too many, too many words in my head at the time. <laughs> oh, I understand. So did you see direct change from the protests you all did, the pamphlets, um, the speaking with people, which I know you did? Mm-hmm. Um, um, so did you see direct change in your leadership? There, there's, I would say that it's a little bit qualified because I don't have direct evidence that it did, but, um, some of the things that told me that they were paying attention. So we did the protests uh, fall 21. We took a break around Christmas time because not so many people come in around there. You start running into winter weather. Um, and so we were like, okay, we're going to pause and we'll reevaluate and do it, start it again after the the winter you know the christmas time frame um probably mid-january we'll reevaluate <clears throat> and right around right before we were going to get started is when the uh, first injunction took place um but what told us that uh, we had hit home and that they were paying attention to what we were doing uh was every year there's a an, a security exercise that's held in february for the first time in, I've ever seen, and this is like over a decade plus, they had a security concern in their exercise for people protesting, which means NAVC knew exactly what we were doing and they probably didn't like it none. Um, I just took it as a badge of, hey, thank you. I know you're paying attention now, thank you. Um, one of the things we did was we would put up the flyers and we would put them up in public locations. So you'd have a location where people were, you know, I need, you know, dog, dog sitters, uh, you know, by whatever, you know, that, that type of open, 
open message board, the general message board. So we would put them up there. We would put them in common areas that there wasn't a message board. So like on fridges or, or cabinet doors or something. And so we would put them up and sometimes they stay for a while. Sometimes they get taken down and we would just replace them. And so there was a case where uh, they would go up and then they would come down and they would go up and they would come down. And I just so happened to be walking through the hallway um, uh, without mask because why not? Um, and <laughs> this was about <laughs> mid, mid 2022. And the person doing it was the division head, my division head. And she's like, I don't know if they can even be putting these up. I'm going to go send these to legal. Cool. They were the ones that we had the U.S. codes that are on that sheet on it. Um, after about two weeks from that, about that time, so they would send out like, oh, you need to do this. You need to have masks. It's mandatory. The language suddenly softened quite a bit. So instead of masks are mandatory, well, you can mask if you want to. Ah, someone went to legal. Legal got to command and command went, oh, shoot. This is federal law. They're not making this stuff up. So before they could always just say, oh, they're, they're just making it up. They just don't want to do it. But when you have the reference to federal law, now it becomes real. And then if you pay attention to the federal trainings, if you do things in outside of federal law, you become personally liable for the outcomes of those. I don't know if it actually happened, but the case legally is you start to run into it. You start to run afoul of federal law when you start requiring people to do things they're not allowed to be doing. Um, that's probably the clearest case I saw of it. Mm -hmm. um, in other bases, when the flyers would go up, they actually took the message boards down. They forbid mm -hmm. them. But it's because they couldn't have people realizing they had a choice. If they realized they had a choice, um, they might actually decide that what's going on is not not right. What policies are still in place that could again force people into this compliant state? Um, I think it's actually two things at once. Um, there's one. There's there's the atmosphere that that allowed it to happen, and the people who allowed it to happen, um, because there are people who knew it was wrong, but they did it anyway because they were told it was legal or they didn't want to lose their jobs. And so they did it anyway. Um, you have that that piece there, the people who had who bent the knee because they didn't want to lose their job doing the right thing. Uh, but you also have policies like, you know, put it in contracts. I expect that uh, the next go around, they're probably going to want to do something similar where it's either a condition of employment or they'll come up with some other way of, of trying to get around the verbiage of the court's ruling um, once they have it in hand, I think they've appealed the injunction to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court says that no, this is this is a legitimate injunction. They'll just find a way around it um, or do it again anyway and dare the court to do something. Mm -hmm. Every year, there's a, a, a environmental survey that goes out. It's called DOX. It's an acronym for something I don't know what it is off the top of my head, um, but it goes around every year and. So in 2021, one of the things that we did was uh, went through, found the questions and gave suggestions on how to answer the questions that are pertinent. Um, and then we did that in 2022. And uh, since it was still pertinent at the start of 2023, we did it too in 2023. Um, just, just I'll, I'll say almost as parting shots because we figured the injunction was going to be a, a, a hard and fast result. Um, but one of the things that came out of those surveys, you know, 2021, they had, uh, I'll say, an expected drop in morale. And they're like, okay, no problem. This, we have pandemic, all this stuff. Well, 2022 came around and morale diminished further. Um, and 2023, they officially gave it out, but I don't have a copy of the presentation or anything like that. It never actually went anywhere. And they recently swapped it around to happening this time of year. So they moved it six months earlier than it normally does. Normally it's in the spring. Um, the last I heard, the, the participation rate, which normally they're able to bribe their way to around 60%, was somewhere like 25, 30% overall. 
um, which tells you a lot. So if they're willing to, to bribe with time off and you have 30% participation, your morale is already in the tank. Why do you think the morale of the compliant people who got the shot, why do you think their mor morale would be low? Probably mostly return to work, honestly. But some of them probably did lose some sleep over the fact that those unclean, unvaccinated people weren't fired. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, they would see us protesting and uh, there would almost always be somebody making a, a gesture like this, like, oh, you're going to get the shot. And uh, one of them was doing it to me when I was doing a protest and I just shook my head no. And so he kept doing it more insistently. I shook my head harder no. And uh, the poor guy nearly drove off the road because he was trying to do this so hard um, that he wasn't paying attention to what he was doing, um, which I kind of took as a perhaps you need to relax a little bit and calm down. Um, but, you know, there's there's some people who really did not like the fact that the unvaccinated never got fired. Uh, there were some people... I'll say in the late 2022, when it was clear the injunction was going to be sticking around for a while, um, they started softening their stance. So there's a couple of people who are very, very, very vax, COVID vaccine, pre, pro mandate type of folks in the office. And I noticed their tone was changing kind of the, to a more acceptance. Okay. Kind of like you won that round. All right. I understand you had that choice. Um, and so that was one of the things that you mean was, they admitted that there was the law behind you. I think more was a resignation of the fact that we weren't going anywhere, um, and we weren't going to change our opinion. Um, I mean, obviously, we have the law behind us, but just because you cite it doesn't mean people actually look it up. In some cases, there is a we're saying in a very general sense, a desire that the other guy needs to just give way. Um, mm -hmm. You know, for, you know, pick your topic. There's a group that's like, no, it's this way only. And there's a group that says, no, it's that way only. And in between, there's not really a good opportunity to, to actually have that discussion. Um, usually what it end up, if you had a, a, a discussion on the, on the merits of the, of the material or even the merits of, of a mandate, a lot of times you have people like, "What?" Well, but there's a an emergency requirement. I'm like, no, there's not. They're like, yeah, it is. I'm like, well, where is it then? Let's go through the Constitution. And usually, once you start going down, back to the law, like, oh, wait, 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 wait. So there is there is a sense, and it's it's I want to say it's a human sense, and it probably is a human sense in the in the case of fear of, I'm afraid, I want the thing that I don't like to go away. And you're willing to do just about anything to do it, which is one of the byproducts of, of why they use fear in the first place. Fear and anger are the two things you can use to control population quite effectively. Um, so, you know, you, you have this case where people are, are driven to that. And if, it, if it's introduced for one thing, it tends to bleed over to other things. You're like, oh, you need to be afraid of this. Oh, well, then it becomes that. Uh, I think in World War I, uh, there was a, uh, a concerted effort to make Germans look bad. Um, and so there were cases where they were renaming um, German foods because people wouldn't take it because it was German. It's like it was tainted. Um, and so that, that type of fear thing spreads and it, it becomes a, a, a contagion of its own. Um, so a lot of these cases, there are, there are people who are like, oh, no, no, well, you run this round as if there's going to be this, some sort of boxing match going on. Uh, that's the mentality. You're already kind of in an us versus them type of thing. And it's not, it's not beneficial in any society to continue that way. Um, and it's something that leadership really needs. And this goes back to the morale question. They need to start thinking, you know what? There comes a point where you have to say, you know what? Mea culpa. We made a mistake. We should not have done this. We should, you know, we're going to work towards moving away from this, not doing this again. And, 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 Working so that we can protect the rights. Um, General Miley just retired, I think it was uh, this week. And one of the things he was saying is like, we're a constitutional, uh, we protect the constitution, we're given oath to the constitution. Um, but he's also one of the same people who was pushing the vaccine mandate, ignoring the fact the constitution gives you the right 
Well, it recognizes the right. It doesn't give you rights. It recognizes the right that you can choose your own path. Um, the medical portion of things is just one of the ones that's not in an amendment. But if you read the Constitution, it says these rights and any other that exist are protected. That's not a, oh, well, these are the only 10 you get. It's these are the rights we're specifically calling out. Others exist. We're not touching those. And when you say, well, you're going to, you know, give up your bodily autonomy for medical things because we say so. Uh, you're going to give up um, personal property because we say so. We're going to give up uh, your right to privacy because we say so. Well, that's where all the nightmares from the 20th century start cropping up and, and really should pop up in your head because that's how a lot of them started. Um, there's, you, you don't. You don't go full authoritarian or full um, denial of rights without having some sort of stepping stone. And that's one of the cautions of this whole thing is, that, OK, if you can't convince somebody to, to take a medical procedure, which is what a, a vaccine is, in, a, in its entire, regardless of what it actually is, that's a medical procedure. If you can't convince somebody by proof and you can't convince somebody by reason, and you can't convince somebody by any other means other than force, you're in the wrong. Because you, once you have to use force to get compliance, either you're dealing with a legal thing, like you're you're capturing a, a thief or an assault or a murder suspect, or you're you're oppressing people for their beliefs. And then you start running down all sorts of bad paths. And my biggest concern off of this is people aren't as aware of what the rights are hence the flyer, mm -hmm. and they're going to go down the same path again because that's the path that they've gone down once already. And they're going to find themselves very quickly in a bad spot because they didn't know they could fight. They didn't know what their rights were. They didn't know you could say no. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really the biggest crux and the biggest damage done is that there are people willing to either tell people they can't do something because they don't realize the right doesn't exist or people pushing back and saying, I don't care what you say. There's no way you're going to convince me no matter what it is. And yeah. both of those cases are very polar and end up, you know, one side ends up oppressing the other and the other side ends up maybe missing out on options. that are actually legitimate, but because they've been so poorly dealt with, from the medical side of things and the trust side of things, they don't trust anybody. I mean, that's why the mm -hmm. CDC has no trust. They kept changing back and forth, changing back and forth. And then the information they put out, they admitted later, oh, yeah, we were lying, but it's okay. No yeah. one's going to believe a medical doctor who says, yeah, well, I did the surgery, but it turns out it was wrong, but it's okay. Um, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, that's how you get malpractice. Well, and it's, it's I that totally thing. agree. Thank, I'm, Jeremiah, you know what, man? Thanks for all the yeah. information that you actually provide to us today it was uh it's excellent it's very excellent helpful. the last question i like to ask everyone is given all that we've discussed today if there's one thing that the american citizen can do to combat this co corruption <laughs> what would it be do more That's research research <laughs> um i would say you know start talking to people just because they have a different opinion doesn't mean they can't be convinced. And even if they're not going to be convinced, they need to know what the ramifications are. Because sometimes you'll say, well, this was this was necessary. Okay, well, what happens if this wasn't, you know, flip the coin around. It was something you didn't want to do. Well, then I would say no. Would you? Because you're willing to you're willing to take the jobs away, the livelihood of people for this. Um, understanding the ramifications, understanding what it is that people are actually asking is one of the things that needs to be called out, but in a nice way, not, not in a, in a confrontational, you're going to listen to me or else type of way. It's, Hey, you know what? I was reading this. What do you think about that? And they might go, well, that sounds kind of, you know, either anti-vaxxer or use some sort of perjurative. Like, well, that actually came from so-and-so you know, national Institute of health CDC. Uh, and they go, wait, what, what do you mean that came from there? Yeah, well, it's right here. They might listen to it, they might not, but then they are making a choice to ignore the truth. Yeah, and that's that's not your call to make. But it also means that you can say, you know what, 
you have the information when this comes up again, which it most likely will, because they're already trying to do it. Yeah. Um, the, you're, you're, you're arming people with knowledge so that if they're on the fence, not really sure what to do now, they have an idea. And that's a lot yeah. of, a lot of times this past episode is there's a lot of people who didn't know what to do. So they just went with the flow. They didn't mm-hmm. know they could fight. They didn't know they could say no. They didn't know anything. Yes. And that's, that's one of the things that I think is the biggest thing right now is, you know what? Start talking to people. Start saying, you know what? Share the flyers. Do you do you have to mask? Because that's a long way to to combating this. Is masking is probably your lowest threshold, you know, compliance. All right, put a mask on. All right, well now do this. All right, now do this. If I can say, you know what? I'm going to arm these people with the knowledge that they don't have to mask. They don't want to, and these are what the risks are. In other words, actually give them consent and informed information so they can have informed consent for these things. Um, then that gives them an option to say, you know what, let's push this out. I'm not going to do this. And here, this is why. Um, there's actually a companion flyer we're going to be put, posting on the, the website we hold rights.com that says, I refuse to mask. And it has the same stuff in there, but the language is, I'm refusing because of this and because of this and because of this. And I still retain my right to say no because it's medical. So we're trying to give people both the knowledge to work with it and the, and the ability to say no in a way that may, they may not be able to sit there and say no and give reasons verbally, but now it's in paper form. They can say, here, this is why. They can hand it to them. If they want to put it in their file, fine, but all they're going to find is that every one of it's backed up. And so that it gives them that gives them the grounds that if they get fired because, well, you just didn't tow the line. Well, now it's in their file that I said you're violating federal law and rights and this and this. And I'm refusing because I'm making a medical choice here. Mm-hmm. And that gives them a much better position to go and um, in general. Yes. This is wonderful. Thank you so much, Jeremiah, for coming on today. You have exemplified integrity and you've given us tools to hold these people accountable that are trying to strip us of our rights. We hold our rights. They are God given. Thank you, Jeremiah, so much for coming on.